Thank you for tuning in. Um, my name is Joanna Brooks. American Beauty is my first podcast. Um, I have a PhD. I'm a scholar by training, and I spent my professional life studying how American culture makes sense of catastrophes. Um, I know that to a lot of us, November 2016 and so much that has followed has felt catastrophic. And a few months ago, I surveyed about 1,000 women who are public radio listeners, and I asked them how they've been feeling since November 2016. And of course, the number one answer was anxious. Um, people are doing more than ever, but very few of us have faith that what we're doing makes any difference. And the media generally isn't helping. The hashtag resist world, there's a lot of snark, there's a lot of outrage, but it can leave all of us feeling keyed up without knowing where to go next. Um, and commercial media, of course, is just designed to agitate us, get us to buy things. But I noticed that even five-minute public radio segments can leave you feeling more anxious than when you started. Uh, the scholar in me believes that we'll find better answers, we'll find greater clarity if we go a little bit slower and dig deeper. Um, we need to understand, I think, that what we've seen in the last few years isn't exceptional. It's just really the coming to surface of patterns in American life that we can wise up and learn to see. Uh, we need to rethink the basic meaning of democracy. It's deeper than electoral politics. It's way deeper than red and blue and electioneering, as important as voting is. This is about the long, long struggle for human dignity. Um, that struggle is on. It's hard. But that work is, I think, beautiful. So that's why I call this podcast American Beauty. And in it, I'm going to bring you voices from women who are engaged in that work as everyday citizens, but also as scholars, as intellectuals, as people who study and think for a living and see these deeper patterns. And what I'm hoping is that it'll help you feel less alone and more connected and more purposeful. I hope it works for you. And I welcome your feedback at AmericanBeautyPodcast.org. And please, if you like what you hear, subscribe rate, and review. We're on iTunes. Thank you. This is what democracy looks like. This is American Beauty, a podcast about the difficult but beautiful work of democracy in our moment. I'm Joanna Brooks. If you feel like something is at stake right now, something much deeper than winning and losing elections, you're not alone. Democracy is about how we live, talk, think, and fight with each other. It's everyday work, and a lot of it is done by women. This podcast amplifies the voices of women like you who are doing the work now, and the voices of women experts who can help us see more clearly and get grounded for the work that lies ahead. It's a conversation in three parts. Episode one. The November 2016 elections brought up difficult issues for my personal or family history. How do I manage my anxiety? No matter how you voted, you have to admit, November 2016 delivered an outcome few predicted, but an impact just about everyone felt. For some, it meant feeling heard, powerfully heard, in a nation that seemed to be slipping away from them. For others, it meant confusion, disbelief, fear, even flashbacks to some of the most difficult moments in our personal and family histories. I remember a few days after the election, driving around my suburban neighborhood, which is ostensibly about 50-50 Republican Democrats, thinking, okay, who voted for this guy, and more importantly, if things got really bad, who would hide my family and who would turn us in? Now, um, I, our family's Jewish. Um, I don't come from any Holocaust survivors. My uh, grandparents and great-grandparents came to this country from Eastern Europe, and I grew up to stories from my maternal grandfather about how he escaped from Russia as a boy by hiding uh, in trees during the day with his mother and brother um, after his baby sister had starved to death and uh, and walking at night. Uh, so um, 
clearly that memory was still with me, but I had never translated it into any kind of paranoia or worry about the present and certainly not about uh, the U.S. So this um, reaction came as a great surprise to me. I am Korean. My I was born here, but my parents were born in Seoul, came over in the 60s. And what came to my mind was the the whole war, World War II uh, situation with the Japanese. I have no doubt in my mind that if North Korea decides to be aggressive and declare war or do something that would cause us to declare war, Trump would uh, do the same thing for Koreans, North or South. And I'm obviously concerned for my safety, but I'm personally a bit more mobile than my parents who are older and not quite so aware of what Trump, how evil he can be. Plus, I have an uncle who is now dead, but he was from North Korea. So what would happen to my cousins? and his and my aunt. I think regularly about the fact that we have family in Canada and though we may not be preparing on a daily basis to leave if we have to, I am mentally prepared to drop everything Is Joanna. Oh my gosh, it's Joanna. So can I come up and interview you for my new project? Oh my god. For, for interview me about what subject? About how you felt after the elections, given your history. Well, well you know, I just, um, I'm, I'm going to be very open and honest with you. That's I'm good. I'm very concerned because this thing hits me so hard that I don't want to end up crying. I know. And if you do, we'll deal with it, but I'll try not to make you cry. Her ever watchful and barky Bijan Friche, Kelvin, gets to the door before Suzanne does. But she follows quickly behind him, scolding him, throwing the door open, and bringing me in with open arms. Suzanne is pretty much a part of my extended family. She's Jewish, but I note there is no mezuzah, a traditional Jewish doorpost marker, on her doorframe. So, my name is Suzanne Salzer Yesk, and uh, I live in Newport Beach, California, which is a beautiful place and has many things going for it, but it also has things that, I don't know, I'm not so comfortable with. Uh, I guess along with the good comes, maybe I won't say the bad, but things that I don't value as much, and I live in a community that is super wealthy, and they um, are very entitled people, and they don't want to hear about what's really going on in the world, because they're living their, you know, their, their perfect little lives, and they've got more money than God. Full disclosure, no surprise, Suzanne is a Democrat and a straight shooter. My conversation with Suzanne actually started the weekend before the November 2016 presidential elections at my daughter's bat mitzvah. And you stopped me, or I crossed paths with yeah. you as like plates right, of bagel right, right, in right. hand. Exactly. And you looked me in the eyes, and you had terror in your face. Did I? Yeah. And I took you by the shoulders. I said, are you all right? What's going on? And I wasn't all right because... I was very, very afraid of what we were coming into with this presidential election. I said to you, it's going to be okay, I think. Mm -hmm. And you said, I've seen this before. What did you mean by that? Well, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty st for me, it's pretty straightforward. And fortunately, it's not so straightforward to people who haven't seen it before. Um, I was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1939. Um, the war was just beginning. My father came to America. He saw the handwriting on the wall. And he said, we have to get out of here before, while well, we can still get out of here. And um, I'm Jewish and my family is Jewish. And um, 
So that was not a good place for Jews. When she was six months old, Suzanne's father sold his business and moved to New York City, planning to get visas and get the rest of the family out. That proved tougher than he expected. He even bribed a congressman who failed to deliver. And by the time the visas came through, Hungary had closed its borders, trapping Suzanne, her mother, and her mother's siblings inside to eke out a living in increasingly difficult circumstances. The man who, would, who you would call president of Hungary was a fascist. Mm -hmm. And he was um, very involved with Hitler. Mm -hmm. And he um, admired Hitler. And he started putting his own uh, Hungarian anti-Semitic rules in from the government. The family lived together um, in one apartment. It was my grandparents' apartment. And it was quite large. And it was very nice. And so the brothers and sisters and my mother and I all lived together in this apartment until years, a few years later, uh, the Gestapo came and stormed the apartment in the middle of the night, and um, people were taken away. Now, And you were there? And I was there. How old were you? Probably around four, five. Mm -hmm. And you, do you remember? Well, I remember flashes of things. I don't remember mm -hmm. the exact incident, mm -hmm. but I remember flashes mm -hmm. of things. And yeah. I knew that what was happening was not good. Her mother's family took heroic risks. Her oldest brother went, decided he was going to go underground and join the resistance. So he just disappeared one day, and he said, don't look for me. Don't ask questions about me. I'm going to be gone. Well, of course, my family had an idea what he was doing, but of course they didn't know, and I was too young to understand what that was. And then maybe six months later, my aunt who just recently died, she was over 90, and um, she decided that she was going to join him, and she was 16. So they both disappeared, and um, if it hadn't been for what they did and put their lives at risk every single day with what they did for years, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. My mother wouldn't have been here. My mother has passed now, but we wouldn't have been here because, you know, most of the people that my family in, in Budapest knew were exterminated. Mm -hmm. my, my family was one of the, the only families in all of Budapest that was left intact. Because her aunt and uncle went underground, they were able to do small things to keep the family safe for a while. But as the war ground on, they had to find other options. When she was five, Suzanne was hidden with a rural Hungarian family and passed off as a Catholic child. She then spent a few months in the custody of the International Red Cross. Her grandparents found safe harbor for a while in a house established by the humanitarian Raoul Wallenberg. The family even hid out in the woods for six weeks one winter. Every time you thought you were safe, something would happen, and your safety uh, was shot to pieces and you had to find something else. That's just the way it went. And meanwhile, Either. your dad is still in New York. Yes, and no, no communication. Oh, goodness. Everything was cut off. No radio, no letters, no nothing. I mean, people can't conceive of that. I mean, there was danger all around every minute. One time when we were still living in my, my grandparents' home, my mother went out to look for something to eat for the family, especially for my grandmother and grandfather. And um, we lived pretty close to the Danube River. Mm -hmm. And as she was walking by one of the side streets of, of the city, um, she saw Gestapo. It's okay. And they had some Jews with them. And one by one, they were shooting them into the river. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother saw that mm -hmm. and told us about it. History teaches us that people survive such times however they can, and often at great cost. My aunt, 
not the one that went underground, but the one that was left in the family, with the family, was a beautiful woman. She was very blonde and she had blue eyes and she looked nothing like Jews. She was, she was the epitome of what the Germans thought were, was beautiful. And you wanna know what my aunt ended up doing during the war? Yeah. She took off her star and she took on a false name with papers, of course, that, that were supplied my, by my aunt and uncle. And she went to work sewing Jewish stars for the Gestapo. And when the war was over, she was wrecked. I mean, she never became, she never became her whole self. And it, she died a few years later. Suzanne's mother, Magda, chose a different path. Uh, my mother was an extraordinary woman. She was. She, um, I don't know, she, all four feet, 11 of her, had more, more courage than most men that I know, and, and women. Um, she decided that she was going to do everything possible in her power to keep us alive. She was on her way, they captured her, and she was on her way. They put her on a train. And by this time, any train that a Jew was put on, they somehow figured out she was Jewish, and they put her on a train to Auschwitz. And that's where she knew she was going, because that's where they sent people at the end of the war. They didn't send them to the other camps, they just sent them to Auschwitz for quick, for quick uh, destruction. And um, so the train slowed down somewhere out in the country, and she could feel that the train slowed down, and she kind of looked through the slits to see where they were. And I don't know how this happened. She never really fully explained it to me. But somehow she managed to get out of the transport um, box that they were taking Jews to its concentration camps in. I don't know. Maybe it was left open. Maybe, I don't know. She never really explained it. She jumped off the train as it started to move. And, and the reason that she did that was because she knew where the train was going. And she figured, and people always said, well, weren't you scared? And she said, yeah, I was scared. And I didn't know if I would even make it. But I was more scared of what I was heading to. Because that was going to be the end. And it was going to happen very quickly. So she jumped off the train. And she made it. And the train pulled out. And um, there were a, and it was dusk. And there were a group of factory workers that had just left work. And she somehow managed to wind her way into the middle of those people just kind of leaving the factory to go home and go about their business. And she just kind of blended in. I don't know how. I don't know. To this day, I don't know how. And that's how she escaped. That's how she escaped the train to Auschwitz. Towards the end of the war, when Germans entered Hungary, imposing their machinery of extermination, Magda obtained false identity papers and went to work keeping house for a family in the country. Because children could not get false papers, she falsified Suzanne's identity as her illegitimate child. We had a lot of sessions about how I was supposed to behave and what I was supposed to say if people asked me about things. And um, one night, there was a banging at the door have I told you this before? No. There was a banging at the door, and it was late. And of course, everybody knew who it was because that kind of banging only comes from the Germans. And it was the Gestapo, and they wanted to see who was living here and why and what they were doing. And so they started throwing questions at the adults, and um, of course, including my mother. And um, time went by, and then they got to me. And um, they said, well, what a lovely little girl you are. Let's have a little talk. Were you in the same room as your mother? Okay. But no, not then. Then They, they had said, you alone. Yeah. Let's, let's just go into and one of the And there's how many? Rooms. Three or four? What? Three or four? No, I was Two. by then. I was like no, but oh, how many? How many? Mm -hmm. Three or four mm -hmm. in their uniforms. Exactly. And oh it's yeah, night. oh yeah. They were fully regaled. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there was no question about who they were. And of course, they screamed that that's what they were. Mm-hmm. They only knew how to shout and scream. They didn't mm-hmm. speak in regular tones. Tones. So they said, why don't we go into the other room and, you know, we'll give you a piece of chocolate. And um, so my mother shot me a look. Of course, she couldn't say anything. And she shot me a look like, okay, this is it. This is what I've been telling you and how you're supposed to behave. And so they did. They took me into the other room. They started asking me, but they didn't do anything harmful to me. But one of them had me sit on his lap. Oh. And I was, you can imagine. And I was, I was scared to death. And um, they started asking me questions. And I can't remember exactly what the questions were, but you can imagine they wanted to know who I was and why I was there and what was I doing and how come I wasn't in school and blah, 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 blah. Well, by some miracle, I passed the test. And they finally let me back into the other room and my poor mother was, I thought she was gonna keel over. Did you feel like you'd done something courageous and bold? No, I don't. I don't feel that way. I feel like I did what I was schooled to do. I mean, I was a kid. What did I know about courageous and bold? Mm. I mean, now I do. Mm. But that's not what stayed with me. Mm. You know, so, I mean, I've told this story so many times to the Holocaust Museum, to Steven Spielberg's people to other people that asked me, friends, and I still cry when I tell it. And here I am, I'm 79 years old. Mm -hmm. And this happened when I was like six. So no, it never goes away. And my doctor said, don't ever look for it to go away because it's not gonna go away. You'll just learn how to deal better with it. The family eventually got out, and in 1946, seven-year-old Suzanne moved to Cleveland, reuniting with her father for the first time since she was six months old. The war had changed both of her parents, and things were not easy at home. But the family said nothing to anyone of what they'd been through. Suzanne enrolled at school within days of arriving. She spoke not a word of English. Within one year, she was fluent. No, our neighbors knew that we came to America after the war, but I don't think our neighbors even knew that we were Jews. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh, old habits. Old habits, <laughs> right. You didn't go around saying, hi, I'm Jewish. So, and I, so you were expected to just walk that into this American life. Yeah, I was, and I did. And it, it like, did you have... Were you, like, physically well? Did you have any physical no, symptoms? No, I wasn't physically well. That's why we ended up in California. <laughs> okay. Um, I had, um, well, I didn't look very pretty. A lot of my teeth were black. From, because of malnutrition. Because of malnutrition. Uh-huh. And I got lung, lung problems. I had a lot of lung problems. Uh-huh. The family moved for Suzanne's health, making a cross-country drive to sunny California and reopened their business, a jewelry store, in downtown San Diego. Legend has it that Magda, after what she'd seen in the Holocaust, had no problem holding off armed robbers who tried to get her to empty the cash register. You lived this American teenagerhood in San Diego, I did. right? You I went did. to high school. Oh, I did. You went to football games, and you went to the beach. I was a song leader. Right. And you had a car that my dad got me. What kind of car did you have? Oh, it was a 1941 Buick. Nice. And my dad had it painted kind of a kind of a a chartreuse yellow. Oh goodness. For me, and and I was the only one in my gang crew and my gang of friends that had a car, and so it was always let's go to the beach, let's go to the Suzanne can drive. No, they didn't call me Suzanne; they called me Susie. Suzanne had some Jewish friends, and the family did join a synagogue, but they only really went at the high holidays. Did, did your family ever at home 
talk about what everyone had been through in Hungary? No. My father didn't, couldn't. Uh huh. He couldn't hear it. What would happen when you say he couldn't hear it? It was painful for him. Physically. It was painful for him. Mm -hmm. So he would. No, that was just not something they discussed because my mother knew that he... Would he get angry? Yeah. Or would, these are all normal things. So yeah. he would get angry? Yeah, he would get really angry. And he wouldn't ever talk about his life in Hungary to me, so I know very little about oh. his life. So he, he was angry. a very troubled man. Yeah. did he? And he may probably have drank or done he some other what? things. He may have drank. No, my father no. never drank. Yeah. He, he was an abstainer. We never even had anything but Manischewitz. Yeah. <laughs> grape wine for Passover in the house. Right. So no, he so, didn't drink, but he was very, very, he was paranoid and he was neurotic. Right. Every day? Did it sort of shape no, your everyday sure. life? It like, did shape my everyday life because he was very moody uh -huh. and um, he, he had a very bad temper. So when yeah. he lost his temper, you just, you just had to get out of his way. Yeah. And sometimes okay. you didn't, sometimes you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. Only when she married her first husband, also Jewish, did Suzanne talk about what happened in Hungary. She finished college, followed her first husband to Purdue and the University of Wisconsin, had two children, girls, divorced, moved back to California, got a graduate degree, and took a job as a vocational counselor with the Job Corps back in San Diego. And all this time, you're not telling anyone Oh, no. No. I mean, who wants to know, you know? What am I going to do? Go out and say, do you want to hear my family history? And and do you have issues like your father had at some point? Are there other health issues? or? No, I didn't have issues like he had, thank God. But I would of still course, like I, was, I was traumatized. Yeah. And, and so where does that live in your house all these years? Where does the trauma live? Deep down inside. Fast forward 30 years. It's election year 2016. Donald J. Trump becomes the Republican nominee for president. This really put the fear of God in me. And I just had this strong sense that this man was going to be harmful. Mm -hmm. Harmful to the people of this country. And how did the sense start emerging again? You know, you said it lives oh, deep inside Oh, well, I you. have, I have, you know, I, I, I struggled with anxiety mm -hmm. all my life to a greater or lesser degree, greater now. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I have a sixth sense mm -hmm. that I think I probably developed when I was a child. Of course. And I have a sixth sense about people. And I just had a very strong feeling that this man, if he became president, God forbid, was not going to be like any other president that we've had in mm -hmm. history. Just a note, that background noise you hear is Suzanne's husband Al making a sandwich, and the jangling is Calvin, the Bichon Frise, who's climbed into her lap. Now, Suzanne didn't vote for President Trump, just like she didn't vote for President Bush or his father, President Bush, either. But this time was different. And we've had flawed presidents before. Sure. And we're a country with a, lots of brokenness in our history. Oh, you bet. So we're not naive about that. Right. We're not naive that we are a country founded through slavery and theft of indigenous land, and yet this feels different to you. This feels different to me. And when I started getting the sense that this man might actually become president, I started, my anxiety started creeping back. For Suzanne, as a Holocaust survivor, what mattered was that presidents are obliged to serve all of the American people. It is, to her, a sacred responsibility. But the way candidate Trump spoke of others unsettled her deeply. Suzanne found herself increasingly distracted, her mind ruminating over and over the prospect of his election. He brought out the worst in people. He brought out the basest instincts about the other. Mm -hmm. 
And we have a lot of others mm-hmm. in our, and amongst us. Yeah. So it's real easy for people who are have that bent to use them as scapegoats for their own problems. Yeah. Which is what happens. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then of course the more you do that, the more you do it. Yeah. And the more I thought about who this man really was, the more it bothered me and scared me, and I just wanted to run out in the street and say, "People, yeah, you don't understand. Yeah, you don't understand." And in fact, I I said that to a couple of people, and they said, "Well, what? How come you understand? How come you think you understand?" And so I would say, "Because I lived it, and I see things that you, and uh, and and the American people who I adore." And I'm one of you because I'm a citizen. But you can't know what a fascist government is like because you've never had to deal with one. You know it intellectually, and you know it's bad. People who are against Trump know it's bad and they don't want it, but they can't know it on a gut level Mm -hmm. because they haven't lived it. Mm -hmm. And the sun is shining. And you're walking around in this beautiful neighborhood in Newport Beach, but inside... I'm churning. Yeah. Yeah. And people aren't hearing you. Well, I don't even... I don't even... I don't expose myself like that. I, I only do that with people that I really trust. And, you know, how many people can you trust? I mean, a handful? Yeah. Maybe There's, 12 at the most. Is there any place in American life today where we have the chance to sit down and say, here are my ghosts? You know, Here's that's a why very I act interesting the way I do. question. It's a very interesting and intelligent question, Joanna. And I really think that the only place in American life today to do that is if you get, either you get a group of people together who also went through similar experiences that you went through as a child, or if you go to a psychiatrist yeah. or a psychologist right. and you unwrap yourself, yeah, I, there's no other place to do that. I want to tell you that even my closest friends, and they're wonderful people and I love them, yeah, they only have so much tolerance to hear about this stuff. Yeah. And then I feel... I feel them sort of turning off. You know, okay, I've heard enough. And who can blame them? Who can blame them? I don't. I don't blame them. Why would you want to hear about somebody's, you know what the word Taurus is? Yeah. Okay. Why would you want to hear about that? After you've heard it initially. Okay, I understand. Gee, I'm really, really sorry for you. And they are really, really sorry. It's not made up. But, okay, it's, I've heard it. I think there are so many people with Cirrus. We're going to there translate. Are. We have to translate. It's, Cirrus is a... Cirrus is like tragedy. Mm. It's like, it's a Yiddish term for bad times. Mm. Living, mm. experiencing really hard times. Yeah. So we have, I mean, just think of this area we live in. So you live it's in paradise. Orange County. Right, but... Up the freeway is the largest community of Vietnam refugees in the country. Yep, about 15 minutes away. And they have Cirrus. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. A Salvadorians. Cirrus. Well, Laotians, Cambodians. Right. You know, indigenous people that have come, people, indigenous people, enslaved people, people. that, yeah, enslaved, I mean, you know. But no one walks around with their Cirrus out. No one walks around. No, nobody does. Um, everyone acts like they either go to church, right? right where right. they can be with people like them who just kind right. of get it, or synagogue or right, school, right, right? Right, Or they go to the therapist, right. or they go home at night and turn off. Yeah, pretty much. What would it mean if everyone walked around with their tsuris out? What would it mean if these sorrows and fears had a place of respect or honor in our political culture? Where would the ghosts live in the great house of democracy? Would it change us? Would it change the way we live together, the way we do politics? And you had relatives who actually joined the resistance, right? And so 
we talk about resistance. Oh, yeah. Right, hashtag resistance. But what do we need to know about resistance that we don't get right now, since you've seen it before? You have to be very, very motivated to change. You have to be motivated for change, to bring about change. You have to be motivated beyond just saying, gee, I really don't like this and I don't want to see it happening. Right. You have to be willing to give of yourself time, energy, money, commitment, regardless of whatever else is going on in your life. Suzanne admits she doesn't have the energy to be a full-time activist right now. She's doing what she can, donating, volunteering for local candidates, telling it like she sees it. But it's tiring and frightening. And she wonders if her life story, if her life makes any difference, especially with how busy everyone is these days, how the time seems to go so quickly. So I know you felt it was important to say things about this moment to people from the basis of your experience. Is there anything that you felt you haven't said that you want to say? Yeah, I want to say to the people that are going to hear this podcast a couple of things. I want to say, please, 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 above all else, do not give up. Do not give up. Because your life and your children's life and the future depends on you not giving up. And no matter how impossible it appears, my mother wouldn't have been alive to come to America if she had given up. And she's my shining example. You know, why, why did so many people give up during the war? Why did so many Jewish people give up and say, well, that's the way it is, and then they met their deaths. But some people didn't give up. And they, maybe they made it, maybe they didn't, but they didn't give up. And that's a rule that I use in my life in a lot of different things. When something comes and I see it as an obstacle, you know, it's sure it's easier to just say, well, I've done my best, I can't do any more. I can't live like that. Mm-hmm. That's who I am. And I just want people not to give up on this country because what we have here is so precious and so rare in this world that it would be a real tragedy if we lost it. It would be a huge tragedy. Broken as we are and have been. Broken as we are and God knows we always have been and we have a long way to go to make it right. And we may never get there, but we have to try. Until there isn't anybody left, we have to try. And I thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Wow. Your tears and my tears. I'm sorry. Oh, you can't be sorry. You had nothing to do with it. I don't care. I know. I know. But you see, it never leaves. Now I understand that. It never leaves. I never, I, I, I thought it would leave, but it never leaves. It's okay. And, and you know, my kids know that about me. They know that. Well, we carry it with you then. Yeah. What would it mean if the difficult personal and family histories so many Americans carry, if all the ghosts had a seat at the table? What would it mean if our sorrows and fears had a way to be heard in our political culture? Would it change us? Would it change the way we live together, the way we do politics? And the way American society works these days, we're often left to deal with our anxiety alone, or maybe put it out there on social media, post a meme, pick a fight, sign a petition, But there is an opportunity in this moment to sit with our hard feelings and our difficult histories and better understand them, to better understand the experiences of our fellow citizens and how we got here and where we're headed. In part two of this episode, I'll bring on three women experts in how American communities, including indigenous and refugee communities, manage trauma and the anxiety that follows and what powerful lessons we can find if we learn to carry our stories together. I hope you'll come back and help us.
We'll give the final word to Suzanne's mother, Magda, interviewed here in 1988. And uh, you're not supposed to, oh, radio, you have to give the radio in. Uh, so you had no, pardon me? So you had no communication yeah, noise yeah. or what was going that on? We didn't, have, we didn't have television, we, radio was the yeah. only uh, outside connection and we had to uh, report, I mean, then give them back to, I mean, give them the radio and uh, our jewelry, our money, I mean, they really, they, they stripped us off from everything. Uh -huh. Did, uh, was there any other way that you could find out what was going on outside besides well, since they took your radio? I'll tell you how. Some brave people were listening the Voice of America. That time they called differently. I forgot what was the name. Uh, and, uh, you know, they had, um, here and there we heard something. We really didn't know about much about Auschwitz. We didn't know about, we know only that, yes, they took some uh, people, the Polish, the German, the Austrian, and other um, uh, Holland people, Dutch yeah. people, they took it to some kind of concentration. But we never know until after liberation uh, that uh, what, kind, what was going on. Oh, yeah. Hi, my name's Teresa, and I'm a co-founder of Haven Tree. Haven Tree is a quarterly subscription box that's focused on your self-care. Each box is filled with items that make caring for yourself an indulgent ritual and not just a chore. Natural skincare products, beautiful totes and planners, purposeful jewelry, journals, and craft kits, because making something is so good for you. Self-care is a powerful tool. We'll show you how to master it. Listeners to the American Beauty Podcast can get $10 off their first box by entering Beauty10 at checkout. Visit www.haventree.shop for more information and to sign up. That's Beauty10 at www.haventree.shop. This is American Beauty. I'm Joanna Brooks. Please stick with us. Subscribe, share, rate, and review today at iTunes. Follow us on Twitter and Insta at underscore Joanna Brooks. Check in at AmericanBeautyPodcast.com. Thanks to Rachel Taylor for sound production, K-Studio for brand design, and to all the women doing the work.